Hi everyone, I am Alice Peters and I'm a professor in bio-inspired materials. In this short video, I'm going to talk about the story of Yonira, which was the best-selling drug in 2020. Well, basically, it was the best-selling drug until the pandemic came along. And this is an antibody-based drug, as you can see in one of the images, which binds to very specific protein in the immune system. And that's why it can be used for a range of conditions. So this is rather than a tablet, this is a drug that needs to be injected. And in this video, I'm going to talk about the importance of antibody-based technologies and how they can accelerate the development of novel medicines. So the medication is called Yomira, uh, but uh, the, the actual name uh, of the active compound is Alumimab, and that's an antibody-based drug. And it had over like $20 billion of sale in 2020. Uh, so for years, this has been one of the top selling drugs, but there are predicted that there are novel similar drugs coming on the market this year. And what's so unique about it is that it can bind to a very specific protein, which is called the tumor necrosis factor or TNF, uh, which is an important protein in the immune system. I mentioned before, that's why it can be used for a variety of autoimmune conditions. And extremely important in the development of this drug, but also a lot of anti, uh, other antibody-based drugs that came after this, was technology by Milstein and Köhler, for which they got the Nobel Prize in 1982. And basically what they did, they took lymphocytes from mice and they fused this with myeloma cells and created there for hybrid cells. And because these hybrid cells, and this was a, a combination of these mouse cells, uh, with tumor cells that made them much more stable and easier to culture. So that really allowed to scale up antibody-based production. But unfortunately, as you will see, because these are not fully uh, humanized antibodies, because here you can see they did rely on, for instance, uh, mice or other species, that can lead to some side reactions. And because these rodent uh, originating antibody proteins could be rejected by the body, so you could get some allergic reactions essentially, there was a need for innovations in antibody production. So what happened, Winter and Nürnberg uh, started to look at bacteriophages, and you can see what they look like in the image below. So basically these are viruses that what we call devour or eat bacteria. Uh, and you can see is that it looks a little bit like a mosquito, I guess, uh, because it can latch onto something and then it can inject whatever it has in the top into the cell. Um, so you can also use this uh, for a novel technique uh, for screening for antibodies, so basically for discovery of novel drugs. And this method, which is called the phage display method, uh, earned them the Nobel Prize in 2018. So how does this work? We would take a gene that encodes a protein of interest and insert that into a phage code protein. So in essence, you would get the genotype, but also the phenotype to match, because they would start to express that protein on the outside. Then we would look at a large pool, so screen a large library, uh, and we would look between the interactions of the proteins that they have on the outside and the target. And when we talk about a large library, I'm not even talking about millions, it's even much more than that. So high throughput screening techniques are really important here because it's basically, you, it's like a needle in a haystack, but what you do is you just find the one that interacts in most of the target that you want. And then you can isolate that one and then you can start producing it. So this has been very important for the discovery of a large number of compounds, but here I'll talk specifically about why this was so important for Humira. And when they discovered this technology, it was important to, to, to show proof of concept for one specific application. And in this case, and that's what the RA in Emira stands for, the targeted rheumatoid arthritis. So TNF, so that's a protein that I mentioned earlier, is known to cause excessive inflammation. However, when they went through this large pool and started screening through their big genetic library, they found specific ones, and these were coded B2E7 antibodies, that bind specifically very well to this tumor necrosis factor. And they found out about this in 1995, and very early on, you have to remember that clinical trials always take a really long time, uh, already two years later, they started the first clinical trials with this specific uh, compound. So what it does, it binds to circulating TNF, uh, and by doing so, it prevents these excessive inflammation reactions from occurring. And this was so successful for the treatment of these patients that it became the first approved fully human monoclonal antibody in 2003. And before this, I remember that they used this technology where they uh, mainly used rodent or originating proteins. 
And this really reduced the risk uh, of allergic reactions that might come uh, with the previous strategy for producing antibodies. And at the moment, this is responsible for treating, well, at least over half a million of patients with autoimmune conditions. And it's also led to a revolution of discovery of other monoclonal antibodies, because these drugs are very important for a range of wide applications, particularly also in cancer medicine. But besides that, monoclonal antibodies are also very widely used in diagnostics. And then there's also an interest in how you can actually produce Humira. So I have a playlist on bioreactors where you can find more about how you would actually produce these pharmaceutical compounds. Now, so the phage display method is the method by which the antibody is discovered. This is not how you produce it in practice. So what you actually need to do is you use a cell culture technique where you can produce the active uh, compound. Now, in most of the cases, people use what they call Chinese uh, hamster ovary cell lines, which is really the workhorse in terms of mammalian cell lines. Mammalian cell lines, even though they're slower growing than, for instance, bacterial cell lines, they do are very similar to human cell lines, and that's why they're very often used for production of pharmaceuticals. Generally, you would have a, a kind of preconditioned step where you kind of first need to make a seed and pre-grow until you get to a certain quantity of the cells that you need. Then it's kind of transferred into a bioreactor and produced at larger scale. And one of the, the first mo uh, monoclonal antibody-based reactors, this is one from 1992, uh, which you can see on the link below. This is kind of what this looks like. But once it's in the bioreactor, you don't just have the cell line, you would have had infected the cell line in order to make it produce the active ingredient that you want. And in most of the cases, it, this is produced within the cells itself. So sometimes you might need to disrupt the cells and then you need to purify all of the other compounds. And particularly, uh, it's very important that you remove all of the other DNA uh, and all of the, the virus that you're working with in order for health and safety, particularly when you're working with pharmaceutical compounds. Now, this is done uh, with a wide range of steps, and this is actually a very complicated process. Uh, because normally in a lab you would use a step of uh, chromatographic techniques uh, where you can base, um, separate based on for instance, size, shape or interactions. And you would go for a train of these chromatography steps uh, and furthermore you would need steps like pH treatment and nanofiltration which is very important here uh, to inactivate the virus that you're working with. Now finally the, the, the medication that we're working with is not just the active ingredient. In fact, the active ingredient is most of the time only a very small compound. So what people need to think about is what kind of buffer conditions that you need. So what kind of salt concentrations, uh, what kind of pH to ensure both the stability and the solubility of the product. And this is particularly important for a drug where you need to inject it because it needs to uh, be present in the right conditions. So this is a very brief overview of how one of the, the top selling drugs, and it will remain one of the top selling drugs for a while, how this is produced, how this was discovered, and how antibody-based technologies are very important in that respect. If you want to know more about general processes in the pharmaceutical industry, then do have a look at the rest of the playlist. Thanks very much for watching.